I want to thank you for joining us today uh, for Bible study. I'm a little distracting with the bright orange. I hope it's not too distracting for you. Uh, I'm not going to tone it down too much. I hope you enjoy the Bible study. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your many blessings upon us. Be with us in our Bible study today that we might be inspired by your presence, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's take a look at what we've been dealing with in the book of Ephesians. Remember, Paul's primary point is been about the unity of the church that Jesus Christ comes to overcome these barriers that divides us and brings us together as one. This is primarily the theme that Paul preaches and teaches us in almost every single lesson, every single book that he's written for us. Be one, be one, be one, be together in Jesus Christ. And so it's really kind of contrary to some of the message that you're hearing recently from some Christians about me and my individual rights for this and that. You, you will never hear Paul arguing for you and your individual political rights. It's just not something that matters to Paul. It's, and and uh, so I'm asking you to weigh your opinions and what you say based upon what the Bible says, because this is not uh, this Americana cult of individuality is not Christian. It's not Christian. So we have to weigh the Bible against the cult of American individuality and realize it's all about Jesus and us. Not Jesus and me and my rights. It's about Jesus and us and our responsibility to love. So with that in mind, Paul in this last lesson that you probably missed if, on, if you're only reading uh, with me the lessons that I've been teaching on Tuesday. From Ephesians chapter 5, then Paul moves on to the impact of this unity in Jesus Christ upon individual relationships. And he deals with husbands and wives and children and slaves. Now, <laughs> Paul doesn't come as a revolutionary to destroy slavery. He just realizes that's just not something he's going to be able to do. But he says that if you are a slave and if you are a child, if you are in a relationship, how do we treat each other? How do we in these real life situations treat others around us? And how do we respond to other people? Now, if you've missed that lesson, do not fret, do not fear. I actually, on Sunday, August the 22nd, on the online worship service, I did this Bible study from Ephesians chapter 5. I did not preach from the appointed lesson for Sunday. So if you'd like to pick up the Ephesians 5 lesson, please go back to August 22nd, the Sunday lesson for the Sundays after Epiphany, and watch that. You can skip all the music if you want to, just go straight to the Bible study. I really am very passionate about Ephesians chapter 5. I just think it's, it's one I use for for uh, marriage counseling, it's, it's uh, and premarital counseling, and, and so forth. It's uh, an important lesson, I think, for us and how we relate to each other. So I encourage you to do that. But let's take a look at this, Ephesians chapter 6. Paul wants to end the lesson for today in our uh, series of sermons, and I should say lessons on the book of Ephesians, with a devotional encouragement. Now, Paul is going to talk about the armor of God. I know, and now I'm referring to my shirt. I've got a mixed metaphor. It's a metaphor. The armor of God. This is also a metaphor. You remember how Paul always talked, or often talked about running the race with perseverance and so forth. I'm mixing my metaphors for today. I know, kind of lame, but I am. I didn't have an armor of God shirt. Oh, well. So we're going to end with a devotional thought, and it's going to be a thought of encouragement. Now, I remember... <laughs> When I was in uh, college, I wanted to write a, a, a paper on Ephesians chapter 6. And my professor said, you know, it's a great lesson, but it's a devotional lesson. I'm not sure you're going to be able to create an academic paper or, uh, on theology based on this, because it's not a book of theology. It's a devotional booklet. I said, oh, I can do this, I can do this. And guess what? I wrote my paper, and I got like a C on it. He said, it was a good paper, if it were a devotional paper, but it's supposed to be a theology paper, and this is a devotional passage. 
And you know, he was 100% correct. And I'm concerned about this passage just because there are a lot of Christians who really wrestle with this about how do we put on the armor of God and how do we put this piece on and how do we fight with this and do that. Folks, it's a devotional piece. It's a metaphor. You're not supposed to wrestle with this as though it is a chapter on the theology of how we put on the armor of God. It's, again, a metaphor. So let's keep it that way. I'm not going to spend too much time on talking about the individual pieces of armor that we put on because it's ultimately a metaphor about how we are supposed to be rooted in Christ. And that's from where we will get our strength. So, ultimately, let's start with the very first verse, chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord. There's that imperative again, mood. Be strong. Telling us what to do, that Paul. Oh my goodness, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of of his power. Now, one of the things I like, this, this word, be strong, this doesn't come through in, in English because we, we have two voices. We have active and passive voices. You know, uh, let me see, I, uh, I eat, that would be an active voice. Um, I was punched in the face, that would be a passive voice. It was something as a verb that happened to me. Somebody did this to me. This is actually what we call a middle voice in Greek. Greek has a middle voice. Huh, how do you get, whoops, excuse me a second. Throw on my glasses around. How do we get a middle voice? A middle voice is something that's done to us, but we're kind of active participants in it. But somebody, so, but there's, so there's something coming outside that's affecting us but we're kind of also participants. It kind of cuts the middle <clears throat> between the active voice and the passive voice. Uh, Greek can be a little bit crazy here. So basically what he's saying is be strong. In other words, you're doing this for yourself. It's being done to you, but the strength to be strong comes from outside of you. Boy, how do you translate that? Now you understand why Greek can be such a challenging thing to do. So again, your strength comes from outside of yourself. It's being done to you, but you're a participant in that. Whew. I'm not even sure how the heck I would translate that. <laughs> but I hope that's kind of helpful. So it's middle voice. Be strong. Something done for us. We're participants. We have a role in this being done to us. But the source of this power comes from outside of us. Hmm, where do you think Paul says the source of power comes from? The Lord, okay? We are participants in something being done to us by the power of God, okay? So be strong in the Lord. I find that really encouraging, and that's actually a good devotional thought, because there are times I'm just not strong. I'm not strong in of myself, it's good to know I have a partner who's helping me be strong. That's Paul's point here in verse 10, which again, I'm sad to say, does not clearly be, is not clearly communicated in any translation of the Bible. That's okay, because there's almost, as you heard me wrestling over this, no way to translate that accurately. So be strong. Our strength comes from outside of us. And then he goes on with this metaphorical thing about the armor of God. And again, metaphor, don't overthink of this. Don't overthink this. It's the armor of God, okay? So we are to put on the armor of God so that you may be able to stand... The purpose of this is to stand against what? The devil. This I really find encouraging too because, you know, sometimes life can be so overwhelming. Paul is going to talk about all these defensive weapons and the, the verb that he's going to use over and over and over again is stand, 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 stand. Hold firm, hold firm, hold firm. 
There are days that the storms of life blow so hard, you can't make any progress. You just got to bunker down and stand against the storms of life. This is what we've been going through in this last year of COVID. I'm outright telling you, it's been overwhelming to everybody in one way or another. And not everybody has dealt well with it. In fact, most of us haven't. We get angry. We're frustrated. We get angry with each other. We take it out on each other. Paul is just saying, just stand firm. It's going to end. The storm is going to end at some point. But stand firm in those days. Remember, God is the one that's giving you the strength from outside so that you might withstand this. So we need to depend upon God. I think a lot of Christians... We haven't been depending upon God to give us our strength. So we need to stand. Just weather this storm. That's all we got to do. It's not about battling everybody. And see, this is what I'm afraid that some Christians have done. They've made it about the armor of God. I'm here and I'll battle people and fight them. There's only one offensive weapon in the list that Paul uses. And it's at the very end, and it's not what you think it is. It isn't something that we chop people's heads off with or kill people, or slaughter them in any way, both euphemist or, you know, metaphorically, or however we're going to talk about it. No, we are, the purpose of the armor of God is to stand. Not to battle, but to stand. To stand firm. Against who? The wiles of the devil. All right. Verse 12, he goes on, For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers against the authorities, not political rulers. He's not saying this. The words that he's using are, again, you're going to hear it a little bit more clearly in this translation, but they're very clearly not political rulers. He's not talking about Herod or, or well, Herod's gone, long gone by this point in Jerusalem, but he's not talking about the political rulers that are ruling in, Jer in Jerusalem. He's not talking about uh, Rome he's, or any of these types of things. Okay, what is he talking about? He's a, but against rulers, the authorities, against cosmic powers of this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. See, he's not denying that there's really bad stuff happening in this world. It is. That's why you need God. He doesn't tell us, let's go take it on and, and kill people. He's not using it for that purpose. This is a metaphorical thing that he's talking about. Put on the armor of God so that you might stand strong in these times. That's what he's trying to encourage us. All right, therefore, take up the whole armor of God, verse 13, so that you may be able to withstand, there's that same word again, stand or withstand. It's the same root word in Greek, uh, the same verb. On that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Again, do you think that's kind of the important word here today? Stand, 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 stand. All right? Hold tight. The weather's going to pass. You need some protection. So therefore, stand therefore, fasten the belt of truth. So again, I'm not going to fix it. Why the belt of truth? This is what some Bible studies and I've seen some Christians do. Well, the belt of truth, because a belt represents this and this. Don't overthink of it. He says, put on truth, okay? Let's just get rid of this whole imagery of the armor of God and just, just think of it. This is what he wants you to hold on to. Truth. Hold on to truth, okay? Which comes from where again? From God. What else does he say? Put on the breastplate of righteousness. We, we really you misuse this word. I'm righteous, and we use it as a judgment against other people. I'm righteous, you're not. No. Where does righteousness come from? Hmm, from God again. We are in right relationship with God because of what God has done. Put on the righteousness of God. Be in right relationship with God. We, we use this as an indictment of others. This is not an indictment of others. So put on truth, put on righteousness, God's righteousness. As shoes your feet, uh, make yourself ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. The gospel, okay, this is important, of peace. 
uh, I, I think some Christians kind of confuse this. We're, we are putting on the gospel of chaos, creating woe, of judgment. We're to put on the gospel of peace. So, and, and I do love the imagery when he talks about this as our sandals. I will say this because remember that Greek word that I love, my favorite Greek word, para, pateo, walk around. Remember that came in our, our previous chapters of Ephesians? When you walk around in life, make sure you're bringing peace with you. Not judgment, not anger, not my righteous judgment of you. And how stupid you are, because I'm right, that's not of God. We are to bring peace. If we're walking around in the world and bringing something other than peace, we're not representing God. Now, I will say this, the gospel will bring disunity on occasion, because people will not like the message of love, that they have to submit to this, and they will wrestle against it. But they should not be wrestling against the message that you're bringing because if you're bringing something other than peace. If they're wrestling against peace, there's nothing you can do about it. But if you're coming out and bringing another message of judgment, of, of personal freedoms and rights, and that's, again, not what we represent as Christians, and that's what a lot of y'all are representing right now, my personal rights, that's not peace. When you walk around in life, you should be bringing peace wherever you go. All right, so go on. So the gospel of peace. Uh, with all these, take the shield of faith. This is, again, nothing more than what Paul has been saying in the entire book of Ephesians anyway. It's just a cute little metaphorical way of pulling this all together. So we put on faith, which you will use to quench the flaming arrows of the evil one. Oh, that's clever. All right. Faith will faith stops the destruction of, 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 uh, of evil. Okay, I like it. All right. It's, it's good. It's a nice image. And take on the helmet of salvation. Again, don't overthink of this. Why is salvation a helmet? Because it protects our head. Please. Just stop. Don't overthink of this. We are just supposed to, if we're going to stand in this difficult day, put on truth, righteousness, wear the gospel of peace, have faith, you know, give yourself over to God's salvation. This is what's going to help you stand. Notice that all of these have their source of God. Hence going back to that middle verb at the beginning. I'll say middle tense. Something being done to us, but we are participants in it. Okay? But the source of that strength comes from what God has done for us. So all of these defensive weapons or protections to keep us safe in these difficult times. But then he says one offensive weapon. One offensive weapon. And it's a sword. Well, why not? And what does the sword represent? The sword of the Spirit. Which is the Word of God. Sword of Spirit, which is the Word of God. Okay? So this is our offensive weapon. All right, you're not going to go out slaying dragons with this. You're not going to go chop off people's heads with this. It's not, again, a weapon of judgment. It's just a weapon of truth. We're coming to bring Jesus to you. The good news. It's really good news. So don't overthink of it and say, I'm going to be stabbing people with a word of God, there's some people that actually do that. They take out the Bible, and what do they do with the Bible? Oops. They bash people over the head with it. It's meant to be opened. It's meant to be an invitation. 
Here's Jesus. Not a weapon! It's Jesus. I'm offering you Jesus. It's kind of a passive weapon. Here it is. Don't overthink this, okay? Yeah, I get to go wield this weapon. It's a weapon of peace, okay? Don't overthink this. We actually, when we open up this weapon, it's actually, once again, who's actually doing the fighting? It's God. And what's God fighting against? The darkness in our hearts, okay? And God is very gentle. So don't use this as a justification to be violent, to hurt other people. It's a metaphor, people. It goes on. Verse 18, pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. This is kind of how he ends this up. That to that end, keep alert, always persevere, persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me. So when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known the boldness of the mystery of the gospel. Again, gospel means good news, right? For which I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare boldly as I must speak. Paul is literally a prisoner in chains in Rome. This is shortly before he was executed. He's not calling for a revolution or for people to fight back in any way. But he is telling them, in these difficult days, be strengthened and emboldened by your relationship with God. Open up the Word of God to other people. Take to them peace in your walk around in this world. And pray for one another that we might be emboldened and have the right words to say, that we might be a witness in our time of trial. So I'm asking you once again, calling the same call I've been over these last weeks, weighing your words, weighing what your social media accounts are saying. Are you being a witness, a messenger of the gospel of peace, or are you sowing discord and chaos because you're so concerned about your personal rights? Will someone hear Jesus through your journey in life and how you are walking about? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in our jury, in our peripateo, our walking about in this life, help us to take the gospel of peace. Clothe us that we might withstand the difficult challenges and days. Let us stand firm in Jesus. And let us bring only one simple weapon, which isn't a weapon of destruction, but is a weapon of construction. Well, it destroys the darkness in our hearts so that we might be opened up to the good news of God, but it's a, a, a peaceful weapon, the, the sword of the Spirit, the gospel of the truth. We just open that up and offer it to people. So help us in this challenging day and time, we are certainly in a challenging day and time, where there is a good deal of darkness. Let us not be contributors to it. Rather, again, let us bring peace. We ask this all in Jesus' name.